Okay, uh, good morning everyone and can I welcome you to the 8th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and other devices to silent mode so that they don't disrupt our meeting. We have no apologies, so hopefully we'll shortly have a full house of MSPs uh, for this particular evidence session. And we move to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. The committee is asked to agree that items four and five, consideration of evidence heard during this meeting this morning, are taken in private. Has the committee agreed to that? Okay, thank you. We now move to agenda item two, social security support for housing. This is the first evidence session of the committee's new inquiry into social security support for housing. This session, uh, this week, will focus largely on private rented housing, and therefore I'm delighted to welcome John Blackwood, Chief Executive, Scottish Association of Landlords, Alice Simpson, Assistant Director, Homes for Good, and Sheila Haig, Customer Manager, City of Edinburgh Council. Thank you, the three of you, and we've got a wealth of experience in, in this area, and we look forward to putting some of your views on the record, but we'll move straight to questions, if that's okay with your agreement. And uh, the first question from Alistair Allen. Um, thank you very much, convener. I think one of the issues that probably several of the committee are, are interested in um, are the whole issue about um, payments uh, to, to landlords and uh, obviously some of the choices that now exist around that, um, and particularly uh, what you feel that's having, or whether you feel that's having an impact on the way that landlords view um, tenants or potential tenants uh, who are on universal credit. Yeah. Um, in the terms of universal credit, the changes brought about by the Chancellor's statement in 2017 probably made quite a significant difference. Um, citizens can choose for their rent to be paid directly to their landlord, um, and obviously the DWP would do that in the terms of vulnerabilities, but now it's actually a choice, so very much like Scottish Choices, if that's what you want to do, that's what will happen. So, you know, that... Um, potential for people to slip into, into debt there should be removed. Um, as well as that, um, we have housing benefit run-on for people who are transferring from housing benefit into universal credit. So you get a two-week run-on to reduce the, um, reduce the opportunity to run into arrears. There's no seven-day waiting period anymore for people on universal credit. So potentially, it's not much different from local housing allowance now. Any evidence uh, that private landlords in particular are, are becoming weary or are advertising a weariness about taking on uh, universal credit tenants? I certainly think there is a nervousness within the sector and, and we're on record having welcoming the, the Scottish flexibilities, but I have to say it doesn't go far enough as far as the individual landlords are concerned. Uh, one concern that we've had and of course this is happening piecemeal as, as it's been rolled out, uh, with new applicants going on to universal credit, yes, the Scottish flexibility has allowed the applicant to actually say pay it direct to my landlord, but that will only happen when it comes to the second payment, not the first payment. So we're actually seeing landlords now reporting to us, they've had, I've got one here in front of me, landlord with same tenant there in that property for years and years, never a problem, always in receipt of benefits, and now suddenly that person's in, in, in rent arrears because they've transitioned. Mm -hmm. There's been a new claim to universal credit, and, and that's a problem. So now we have rent arrears that never existed before. And my concern there is that this is only the tip of the iceberg. I think once people do transition from housing benefit through full service into universal credit, we will see a huge amount of rent arrears, as social landlords have found certain, certainly in England. Alice Simpson, do you want to add? Um, we're finding that um, about 75 per cent of our tenants are accessing benefits for all or part of their income. Um, and um, we are finding that the Scottish options in theory is really good, but in practice um, there are tenants that have vulnerabilities that should have the DWP alternative payment arrangements in place. Um, but job centres, when they are instigating the universal credit claim, are opting for the easier route, which would be the Scottish options. Um, our, under, our, our feel from that is that um, they're not seeing the, the impact of that is then that um, a tenant can cancel their Scottish option to get it paid direct to their landlord. Um, it makes it harder to do third party deductions um, and makes it much more likely for that person's tenancy to be at risk. So um, for the very most vulnerable tenants um, who have been homeless and have mental health issues, they are the ones that are most likely to, to fall 
to fall negatively from that. We, we appear to have a system where obviously the default option is, uh, uh, is, is not payment direct to the landlord. It's a certain amount of effort has to be made uh, for that to happen. I mean, in principle, what, what do you feel about that? I mean, in terms of the groups of, of tenants that you're all dealing with, how, how much of an effort is it to, to, to change things so that the payment goes direct to the landlord? Is, is, that, is that functioning? Um, we're having quite a significant issue at the moment where this has happened in a number of tenancies, but in one tenancy at the moment, um, they had always had safeguarded house and benefit, they've moved on to universal credit. Um, they got put through for Scottish options um, and for four consecutive payments, the payment went direct to the tenant, even though she, it, she had it journaled that it would be coming direct to us, um, which has increased her anxiety levels and, and, and she's fallen into rent years because it happened around about Christmas. So um, it's also the administration time at our end has meant that instead of our tenancy support, helping our tenants to, to make improvements to their lives and access education and things like that, they're now spending all of their time on the phone to call centres. Information on that, Mr. Blackwood, do you want to come back? Yeah, I can certainly here? agree with everything Alice has said there. That's what we're hearing from members as well too, uh, and that they're aware that their tenants are becoming increasingly disadvantaged just through the system. And I think we have to remember that the reason why we've got this problem and experiencing these issues is actually not to do with the tenants. It's actually the system that's creating the issue here. And that's our biggest concern. So whilst we welcome universe, eh, sorry, welcome uh, the Scottish flexibilities, there are these cracks that tenants are falling into. And these are our most vulnerable people in society and we should be trying to support them. And, and of course, the system doesn't do that. Anything. Yeah, what I would say is, is in our experience in local housing allowance um, prior to universal credit, um, the, the figures that I've taken off the system at this current point are showing around 90% of people in receipt of local housing allowance are actually receiving that directly to themselves, and I'm assuming paying the rent. But, you know, it, it's perhaps um, a, di a different clientele, but certainly from our evidence, um, Local housing allowance has traditionally been paid directly to the tenant, and that's worked well for a number of years. Sorry, just a, I'm conscious of the subject, obviously, of direct payment, which is what you, you asked there. Certainly, we would welcome that. We think that would be a positive step to encourage landlords to take new applicants in receipt of benefits, and I think that would reduce a lot of the barriers that are out there. We've called for that in a written evidence, and we hope the Scottish Government would consider that. Some, some of the, the Scottish flexibilities are constrained, I suppose, by UK policy as well. Um, but uh, you, you won't find me disagreeing with the, the premise of what you're saying there. Um, but I was just interested to know whether you felt that um, tenants themselves were aware of what their options were or what uh, efforts were being made to, to make tenants aware of what their choices were. I, I would think that at that initial um, meeting with the Job Centre Plus, um, it, it tends to only be around 17 minutes, I think, that each job advisor has got with the, with the citizen. And I think that's potentially where issues um, are, are occurring. If people um, had more time to spend with their job advisor, I think that the checklist of everything that's, that's open to them uh, would be easier explained. But obviously, the DWP are under the same constraints as many other um, public organisations. And, and the amount of time that they can spend with people is constrained. Okay, can I maybe just pick up something in that? Because, I mean, we did our last inquiry in, into um, universal credit and 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 uh, the w working poor and low-income families there. We, we, we rehearsed some of these arguments as well, and something didn't sit easy with me. And and that was we talk about the choice for for tenants, mm -hmm. and we talk about Scottish options. It's not an option about whether to pay your rent. It's a responsibility. And yes, the money may nominally be yours and sit in your bank account for a period of time before you then transfer it to the landlord. But actually, there is no choice here. It's your responsibility to pay your rent. So put simply, shouldn't the money just go straight to landlords anyway? I can't disagree with that. I think that should happen. Whoever the landlord is, whether it's a local authority, housing association, or indeed a, a private landlord, uh, I think where some tenants find it difficult is that if they're experiencing difficulties in their life that some of, of Alice's clients actually are, then this becomes a much lower priority. 
And often we find from tenants to say, listen, I just need to know that my rent's paid. At least I know the roof over my head is okay, then I can go on and sort out the rest of my life. And, and I think that's an important empowerment, actually, to help support tenants. And of course, that was taken away some years ago, where they didn't have the option to elect it to be paid direct to the landlord. Uh, so the fact they've got it back now is a good step, but actually, why not just pay it direct in the first place? Yeah, and I'm going to come back on a little others just to kind of just flesh that out a bit more because this committee will have to make recommendations one way or another, which is why I'm just pushing on this a little bit more forcefully. To, but in terms of uh, the private rented sector, uh, I see from the Scottish Associated Landlords uh, p position and evidence ahead of today, one of the big concerns for landlords, of course, is uh, rent arrears and uh, securing that, that guaranteed uh, income that you should get when you rent out a property. Uh, there's an, there's, you know, there's an absolute guarantee there if the money by default goes straight to the landlord. Would that encourage more landlords to uh, take on those who are in receipt of benefit? Yes, I think it would. I, I, I don't think there's any guarantee because, of course, the person could lose their entitlement to benefit, so therefore the money wouldn't go direct to the landlord. So there is always a risk, but there's a risk of somebody losing their job as well too and not being able to afford to pay the rent. That's the business that we're in. Mm. So at least it would give some additional reassurance to private landlords uh, that that money would be paid direct to them. So, so the system would be communicating direct with them. So we're not really doing, from what I can see, tenants any favours by telling them they've got this choice when actually it's their responsibility anyway. So we actually, even though ostensibly some individuals might like the idea of having the money and then being empowered to, to give that money to landlords, or, or they may just not care either way, quite frankly, I don't know. But we're not actually doing them any favours, because when they have a point of crisis, for a variety of reasons, as any of us can quite frankly do in, in society, as you say, paying the rent might be one of the first things that, that hits the buffer. So actually, is it in the best interest of all tenants, probably, to have the money go straight to the landlord also? Any views on that? Sheila Hagen, then Alison Al Simpson. I would tend to disagree. Um, I, I think that, you know, to make assumptions that just because you're on benefit, you're not going to pay your rent is probably not appropriate. Um, I think that, as I've given evidence for local housing allowance in Edinburgh sitting at 95% of people receiving that directly, it's, you know, there, there is evidence that people are paying their rent. Um, and it's not to say that somebody working with a really fantastic salary is going to pay their rent because people do make choices. Um, so I think to single out benefit claimants as being non-rent payers is probably unfair to them. Fair, I didn't single them out. And I think that should be clear for the record. If you go back and listen carefully, you'll see that. Maybe I should put it another way, Miss Haig. Is it a price worth paying for all rent payers in society that if the default option is if the money goes straight to the landlord, it actually protects vulnerable tenants because we have no way actually of effectively screening for who those vulnerable tenants are to make sure that they are protected in such circumstances. There's no suggestion that the vast majority of people in receipt of benefits don't pay their rent because they do. But one thing is absolutely clear, rent arrears has increased quite significantly since money has started going to claimants rather than direct to landlords. Is that not a reasonable thing to say, Ms Haig? But money has always gone to tenants through LHA. So, that, you know, UC hasn't really changed that mm -hmm. um, because LHA, the, the, the principle in LHA, when that was... Uh, um, unfortunate enough to remember when that was first introduced. Mm. And the same statements were made at that point mm. and the same assumptions were made. However, mm. the, in yeah. reality, um, that, that didn't happen. You know, the world didn't mm. cave in when local housing allowance started. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really important to protect vulnerable people mm. and it's really important that the DWP identify mm. that at that point of claim and make mm. that decision that you know, in their best interest, that, that should go. But I think it's all about having that advice right at the beginning to, to support people in making the right decisions because people may make that decision for, for ulterior reasons. So I think if I was to recommend anything, it's to get that support in right at the beginning so that people are making informed choices. That's, that's really important. Thank you for putting that pretty clearly on the record. Um, Mr Griffin and Mr Balfour wants to come in, but just before they do, Ms Simpson, do you want to add anything and I'll bring my colleagues in? Yeah, um, I, I agree that um, tenants that are accessing benefits are just as likely to pay their rent as, as tenants that are working. Um, I personally set up my direct debits to come out in my bank account the day after I get paid so that I don't have to worry about that all month. 
Um, I think that it would be cost effective if all payments went direct to landlords because they are for housing costs and it would reduce the amount of administration both at our end and at your end. Um, but in addition to that, when our tenants are in extremely limited budgets, um, we are a provider of food bank vouchers and we have had to increase the amount of food bank vouchers we hand out by 400% over the last year. Um, then having a significant amount of money placed in your bank account that you then just have to give away to somebody else is much more likely to make you decide to use that money for something else. And as soon as you've got two months of rent arrears, when you have such a small income, it's much harder to come back from that and can end up with you going into the homelessness system. So I, th I think it's an, a no-brainer that if it's for housing, it should just go to housing. OK, um, so a variance of views, and it's, but it's important we get them all on the record, so I really appreciate that. Uh, Mark Griffin. Yep, it's, it's just to come back to um, the subject of, of choice. Um, just now we have uh, default payments to a tenant who then have a choice to uh, switch to direct payments. What would your view be on a system where um, payments to landlords was the default option, but still maintaining a choice for tenants that they could choose to opt out from that? So heads are not captured by the, the official report. Uh, I think I saw a nodding head from Alice Simpson, so I don't know if you want to, to say something. Yeah, well, I would, I would say that um, the, the biggest issue for us has been that when payment is meant to come direct to us, it has gone to the tenant, and they've not been clear on that. Um, and that's what's led to arrears. Um, and the fact that the Scottish Options doesn't kick in until at least the second claim um, date. So if it was the default that it went direct to the tenant and the tenant could choose to manage their funds themselves, then that would be fine. Um, the issue at the moment is the administration of the universal credit system isn't fit for purpose. Which we may come on to. Yeah. Sheila Haig, would that, apologies Mr Blank, would, would that be a reasonable compromise in relation to that? Um, I don't have a, a, a passionate view one way or the other. Um, what, I, what I would say though is that if, if we mandated all payments to landlords, um, there are complexities in there because not everyone receives 100% of the rent through universal credit. Um, and that's been a real issue for councils where they have had managed payments and alternative payments arrangements because they don't know exactly how much that's going to be. So there's no real, it's not like housing benefit where there's, there's pretty much a reliance that what you receive every month is the same. It's not really the same with universal credit because of the nature of that. Um, so you, you may find yourself collecting multiple income streams. So you, you may have an alternative payment arrangement. You may have a, a managed payment coming for, for arrears. You may have a DHP payment that has to come in if the person has, has a shortfall on their rent and we've decided to pay DHP. And you may have a contribution from the tenant themselves. So you could be managing um, income streams where it would be easier if they actually received it and gave you the whole payment. So would it be worth piloting maybe in one local, perhaps not Edinburgh, given your, your slight reluctance, <laughs> uh, but piloting that in a local authority area just to see how default to the landlord goes, for example, Miss Hague? I'll come to yeah. you in a second, Mr Blackwood. Yeah, I think, I think a pilot would have less, you know, it, it would give us really good raw data, um, but there, there would have to be, you know, a satisfactory mix, sort of tenures and things like that. So, I mean, I'm more than willing, yeah, to say a pilot would be good. As long accept, as it's not I just accept the, 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 the private rented sector dynamic is very different in different local authorities and, and there may be a, a variance of views with local authorities across the country as well, depending on that dynamic. Mr Blackwood? I think it's a very sensible idea for direct payments to be made to landlords for a number of reasons, but two are very, very important. I think one is it reduces rent arrears that tenants can build up and another one is it can avoid homelessness. And these are two major issues that we need to be taken into consideration. And it's the system alone that's creating rent arrears and creating homelessness. And we need to avoid that as much as we possibly can. I do also agree, though, you know, we shouldn't make assumptions about anybody who's in receipt of benefits there. As we've already pointed out, uh, many of them are more than capable of, of paying their rent like anybody else. So they shouldn't be differentiated in any way. And that choice should still be available to them. So if they feel they want to take control of the rental payments for whatever reason, 
then they're more than entitled to do so, and I think that should still remain as well. Okay, maybe approaching a, a very balanced position. Alice Simpson, before I take Jeremy Balfour in, do you want to add anything? Um, just, just really quickly, we're doing a House and First pilot at the moment um, at, with the City Ambition Network in Glasgow. Um, we've got tenants where, between us and their support workers, um, they have been taken to start bank accounts, to go into job centres, they've been rough sleepers, put into tenancies with multiple and complex needs, and the job centres are suggesting that they go into Scottish Options instead of the Department of Work and Pensions Alternative Payment Arrangements. They are the most vulnerable people that should be getting put straight forward for the Alternative Payment Arrangements. Can I thank you for putting that on the record? And it also allows me to put on the record that I had the privilege of going to the, the Glasgow Emergency Night Shelter um, last week, and I saw one or two uh, of the individuals using the night centre who was shelter were getting the immediacy of uh, housing first options uh, in Glasgow um, and it was very very interesting a very very worthwhile uh, pilot that, that, that I saw there so I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to put some of that on the record. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I wonder if I can just pick up two points that have already come out and just to explore them further and this shows my ignorance really for you John. Sheila talked about this two week transition period. Did I not can you did that not explain or help the people that you're representing that two week transition period and, and why does it work for the local authority and not for private landlords that two week transition period? I think one of the issues is with local authorities, registered social landlords in general, they have access to the landlord portal. So they are provided with additional support and assistance from the DWP that's not available to private landlords. So private landlords are in the position they don't know this two weeks payment exists. So obviously it's part of our job to get that information out there. But there's a lack of information. There's a lack of support that's provided. Obviously I'm representing private landlords, talking about the support that's available to them, but I think equally to private tenants as well too. Mm. Now, it's a new system and that takes time to bed in and nobody likes change. And I think there's an issue with that too. But you will see from our written submission is that a big part of the caseload we get from landlords is saying nobody communicates with us. We send emails. Who do we phone? Because we're trying to help the tenant, especially the most vulnerable, who aren't empowered to make the calls themselves. Landlords are willing to help, but to just be told, oh, we can't speak to you or not even reply to an email is not acceptable. I have to say, obviously, part of our work is trying to engage with the DWP to, to make these issues much easier for both landlords and tenants and we're building good relationships with the DWP but it's an uphill struggle and we really feel it's the system that's creating that problem and it's disadvantaging the very tenants we're all trying to help. But if 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 you if a landlord knew about this two week that would help? It would help in the knowing that it exists but it doesn't mean to say you're going to get that money so and of course many tenants are experiencing hardship and they might have other priorities in their lives other than paying the rent. Okay. And I'm afraid when it comes to it, although we all might think the most important thing is keep a roof over your head, pay your rent or your mortgage, whatever that might well be, uh, but actually other priorities in life come up at that time okay. and it might well be that landlord never sees that money. Just following through your argument logically, John. I'm going to let you to ask that next question. It's just that I, I saw that Sheila Hague was well, going to that as well, but I'll, yeah. I'll come yeah. back in. I, mean, I, I would say that the two-week run-on is something that's, that's automatically awarded when we get a housing benefit stop, so that's for people moving from housing benefit to universal credit. When people receive universal credit, that first payment, because of the changes in 2017, a full advance can be given. So... People should should not experience that hardship. And, and I, again, I know that it's the issue about how do we get that money, um, and that's a problem. And that's a relationship because that's a contract between um, landlord and tenant. Um, but the, the difficulties that people have contacting DWP and things like that is the very fact that someone is receipt in, in receipt of universal credit is a personal matter. And, you know, without the tenant's permission, you could not share that data. And I'm aware there's, there's more stringent controls in there than perhaps in current schemes where a mandate only lasts for that question. Um, whereas with housing benefit, if we had a mandate to discuss with, with the a landlord that that would hold until it was withdrawn. So these are, but these are things that have been put in place by the, by the DWP. I can see why they've been put in place, but perhaps that's a focus. If 
if where a tenant does need support, then if a land, if the mandate lasted longer and that conversation was better, um, I think that would improve things. Yeah. Jeremy, yeah. thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, if we just kind of push a bit, John, because I mean I have felt slightly uncomfortable about some of the answers and questions so far. Because I, I, I mean, I suppose to take your argument logically, would you say that any landlord should get should be able to go to an employer? and get their money before it comes into their bank account to guarantee that the rent is paid. Because we are, I think, making quite a, I, I think a very unfair distinction between those who are on benefit and those who maybe are working and how they pay. So the logic to your argument would be that your, the people that you represent could go straight to the Scottish Parliament and take my rent out before I see it. I mean, that is the logical way that the argument goes, and or why are we drawing a distinction between one set of people in Scotland and another people in Scotland? I just feel slightly uncomfortable about some of the answers. Whether you can clarify. Quite happy to come back on that if you want. I don't think it is logical to, to draw that conclusion. I don't think we're com comparing apples with apples. We are trying to encourage people, private landlords, to take tenants in receipt of benefits when we know these tenants, some, in some cases, are struggling to access the money to pay their very rent. Now, that's a very different scenario to somebody who's out there working in an everyday job. Effectively, tenants should still have the right to be able to take control of their own money in the same way as you or I could be who are earning a salary. But effectively, we're trying to encourage the sector to take some of the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged within our society. And the landlords who we are representing and who have been taking people in receipt of benefits for years are saying, we have no problems with the tenants. We built good relationships with them over the years, it's the system that's failing them, not the tenants themselves. And of course, if rent arrears rise, and I'm afraid that's the stark reality of it, we know that's happening. There's more and more rent arrears through universal credit now than ever was in housing benefit. And perhaps that's for a number of reasons. And I'm sure we can work together to try and solve some of these problems. There's many ways of achieving that. But I think a very positive step would be to say to landlords, listen, if you're going to take somebody in receipt of benefits, we can mandate that direct to you. That's what we would do as, as the government, as the, the powers that we have to be able to do that. I think that would be a positive step. And then from that, the tenants can elect through their own choice whether that continues to be the case or not. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just like to say that our biggest issue isn't that um, all of our tenants that are accessing benefits need the payments to come direct to us. The issue is that the tenants that have asked for the payments to come direct to us or have gambling and addiction issues previously um, where it wouldn't be beneficial for their health for them to receive the rent into their bank account, they are still receiving their rent which is the only reason that I'm going if it would be simpler for the housing component just to come to us, and that would be, that, that would make sense. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's all very interesting. Shall he, do you want to add anything to that before we, we, we move on? Yeah, I, I, I do think, and John and I spoke about this before the meeting, that there's probably been a lack of engagement with private sector landlords. The DWP have done a really good job at engaging social sector landlords, um, and that's because they're very accessible. Um, we did um, have some sessions for private sector landlords in advance of universal credit in the summer, um, and we, we did use our landlord portal, but unfortunately something went, went wrong and only eight landlords um, attended these sessions. But um, I would say going forward, um, having John's details now, that Edinburgh will be um, working uh, really strongly with our private sector landlords because we're in a unique position as opposed to the rest of Scot uh, Scotland on the size and caseload that we have in the private sector. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of good work to be done with local authorities in collaboration with the DWP to work with private sector landlords, to do a bit of myth busting and to highlight that there's DHP available, there's rent in advance available, there's um, help with deposits, there's help with removals, uh, if these things actually obtain a better outcome for citizens. So I am more than willing to be working um, towards that with private sector landlords. Thank you very much. Might let you back in later, Jeremy. Get through some more. Welcome back, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Convener. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, 
first of all, I think what you said there is of concern to me about the lack of engagement with the private sector, because arguably it would be more important, in my personal experience, um, I would be more concerned about private landlords giving up on the idea of taking tenants who are on universal credit. Um, and, and that's really, I suppose, the basis of my first question, which is, <clears throat> have you noticed any trends amongst landlords just saying, I no longer wish to rent to um, tenants who are on uh, universal credit payments? Have you seen any behavioural changes, or do you expect any? I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, and I know uh, within housing legislation, it's actually uh, not permitted to say, I, w I won't take you because you're on benefit. Um, however, you know, people may do that, but um, it isn't the case that it's, you know, it's... I, I would say from, from our perspective, um, we are noticing that there's landlords that aren't willing to take the increased risk of previously if somebody was on housing benefit and we thought we would be able to safeguard that rent. Um, it's, it's been really easy for landlords that want to work with us to get them to accept tenants that are accessing benefits. Um, on universal credit, it's a very different story that you're saying. You're saying move into this property without any money up front. Um, in six weeks' time, you might get some rent and you might not. Um, and that is a much harder, that's a much harder sell. Um, it's nothing to do with the tenants, um, but actually that's part of their affordability. Uh, we, are, we are certainly seeing evidence of it, and we've got a post bag that demonstrates that, that effectively more and more landlords not only are now saying, do you know what, I won't take anybody uh, who's in receipt of benefits because of all the stories I hear, and let's face it, in the press we always hear the worst stories, uh, but beyond that, we're actually seeing landlords with existing businesses where they're offering, and have been for some considerable time, tenancies to those who are in receipt of benefits, now changing their business model. They're now saying, I can't afford to stay in this marketplace anymore. And quite frankly, wherever you are in Scotland, there's more and more demand in the private rented sector to provide accommodation. Mm -hmm. So there will be more and more people out there who are in work, who are seen to be, shall we be perfectly honest and use the expression, a better bet to a private landlord. And they don't need to worry about dealing with the DWP and universal credit and understanding all the details of it. That's the stark reality. And we're seeing landlords shift their business model already. And at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any immediate solution to that because of the five-week wait. And the design of universal credit means unless that changes... I mean, any other solutions? I mean, I, I can't think of any. Housing benefit has always been paid in arrears to private sector landlords as well. Right. So it's paid at the end of the period. The advantage with universal credit, um, it might be a disadvantage to the citizen right. themselves, is that right. they could get that money up front. Right. So they, they could get a full advance. They may not want to because that will be deducted over a course of 12 months. But, in, you know, LHA has always been paid in arrears as well. But, you know, what, what we do highlight um, is the, and we highlight this to tenants because that's who we, who we deal with, that DHP is available for them and they, can, they could get rent in advance, um, provided, you know, that the outcome is going to be better for them. So, so that would solve a problem for the landlord and the tenant, but in the long run, the issue with that is the debt then builds up and there's evidence that higher levels of debt for those in universal credit because of that where they've taken an advance payment? D DHP isn't, um, isn't paid back. So if we paid a rent in advance and we paid um, a deposit, that isn't claimed back. Yeah. However, that does put, as universal credit um, extends, that's going to put huge pressure on the DHP pot and we would obviously be looking to Scottish Government as to how we fund this. Mm -hmm. And we may come back to you at some point about local housing allowances, which could also solve that problem separate from discretionary housing payments, but I know that's not the line of questioning you're particularly following at the moment, Deputy Convener. Any other comments on that before Deputy Convener comes back in? Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess if you look at the issue of under 35s, which used to be 25, I think, and now it's now 35s, and the shared room rate... Um, Again, would you see that land, any issues with landlords preferring not to have shared tenancies? Is there any evidence of that market changing? Um, we don't have any 
have any issue with um, our landlords accepting shared tenancies, um, but we do have an issue with um, quite socially excluded people that are under 35 with mental health issues or care leavers that are over 23. Um, that we then have to apply for, for DHP to, to make up their rent because they don't have anybody to share with um, or it wouldn't be suitable for them to share with a person. I think it is much harder. I remember the days when the under 25 rule came in effectively and we thought that was unfair back then and of course uh, now it's under 35 year olds. I think there's a very big difference about being 24 or you know, tw uh, 24 or 34, you're at a different stage in your life. So sharing with a stranger is, is, is a difficult and a different prospect. Certainly as landlords and as letting agents, we're not in the business of, shall we say, renting rooms. So you'd be looking for two people or three people to come along who are willing to share, all of whom are in receipt of benefits. So uh, that doesn't happen very often. I think it's harder to for those tenants to find suitable accommodation simply because of their age. I, I, don't, I noted what you said earlier about um, the issue of um, universal credit causing rent arrears and creating more homelessness. Um, would you say in your evidence that there is some evidence that you put to the committee to suggest that the design of universal credit has destroyed a sustainable relationship which landlords have had yes. with tenants who've had been on welfare benefits for long numbers of years. And that's going to have an impact on society. Exactly. So it isn't just a question of tenants not being able to go into the private sector because landlords don't trust the system. Mm -hmm. Landlords are having to change their business model. Mm -hmm. But, the, but the, there is an overall impact too which is that society is going to have to pick up the pieces of this because of debt and homelessness. It, it, would you agree with that? Yes, I do. And, and I think, ironically, what's happening is we're encouraging or we're creating a system whereby some of the most vulnerable in our society can end up in debt. And I think fundamentally that's wrong. So you are right. We've got landlords who've been operating uh, where they've been providing tenancies to people in receipt of benefits for many years. That's been their business model. In some areas of Scotland, that's the tenants that they're dealing with, and that's how they've operated. Over those years, they've also built up very good relationships with the local authority. Uh, so like the city of Edinburgh, other areas who do engage well with the sector. So you build up your relationships, your local contacts. If the tenant is struggling with their benefit payments, uh, there's been a change in the circumstance, you've got a go-to person in that local authority who can help you understand the system and give you the contacts and support that you need, whether you're a private landlord or indeed that tenant. Now, all of that local network, those local supports have gone with DWP. So the landlords are coming to us and saying, yes, there's been a change in circumstance with our tenant. Before we would have gone to the council, they would have been really helpful and supported us through the process. And as long as I know it's going to be sorted, I'll get the rent at some point. Mm -hmm. So that there's a kind of reassurance there, if nothing else. With DWP, they're literally told from word go, I'm sorry, we can't discuss this with you. So therefore, and you're asking, quite, I don't understand it myself to be able to tell the tenant, sorry, they can't go into any detail. You write emails, it's all detailed in our, our written evidence, just a lack of communication, if nothing. And of course, this happened, as we know, in the social rented sector and housing associations, DWP then supported them by providing them with a landlord portal, which has gone a long way to actually reducing rent arrears and supporting tenants and avoiding homelessness. We don't have access to anything like that in the private rented sector. And whilst I appreciate it would be a very diff diff different system that they would have to create for private landlords than social landlords, at least a helpline, at least somebody to speak to, some dedicated resources for private landlords. I hope that will happen. We're trying to work with the DWP to create that. But that's the problem here today. Thank you very much. Absolutely, that would add. So that having a point of contact would make would be the absolute biggest change to the way that our organisation is able to operate. Um, we own a number of our own properties, and in them we've had tenants that, because um, tenancy start dates have been in input incorrectly by a job centre person and things like that, there's been three months of arrears that have accrued. 
if they weren't one of our tenants, there's a good chance that they would do, uh, that landlord would have chosen to take that tenant forward for eviction for rent arrears. Um, we aren't able to see the information the same ways we would have been able to see under House and Benefit. Um, if we were able to see that information and we had somebody to speak to, then that would be perfect. Um, an example of that is that recently we had 10 formal complaints raised with claims that had started from one job centre. Um, the claims actually related, uh, sorry, the, the complaints actually related to um, what had happened in the call centre, not at the actual job centre. Um, but from that, we've managed to get contact with one person who has spoken to us and they have managed to resolve all 10 complaints, um, which all means that we're able to, to, to continue with those tenancies. Um, makes all the difference having somebody that we can speak to. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Did you want to come back in? No, that's all. Thank you very much. Sheila, did you want to add something? There? What I would say is universal credit means that landlords are going to have have to have that more direct relationship with their, um, their tenant. Um, and wh what they can do um, is, if, if if the tenant is sitting with them, you know, they, ca they can deal with the tenant and the DWP. Um, and if, if they use the phone that's registered, they get directly to their caseworker. So that means you actually are getting to the person that you need to speak to. And again, it's these facts that are little known and it's something that we will be working hard on to get that information out to the private sector because some of these problems do have solutions. And I think that's, that's the important thing is that we resolve that. But we seem to be getting to, to a stage where there's no individual sole reason why there's a reluctance in the private rented sector, but when you, you when you join all the dots together, you realise why there's a growing reluctance to to, to, to engage with uh, the, uh, benefits claimants, and, and but, but some of these can can be dealt with and solved. Uh, now, I was going to take Keith Brown next, unless there's a supplementary on this particular uh, issue. Okay, sure, Robinson. I just wonder, though, I, I hear what you're saying, and I know landlords do that, but you know, that's quite a big ask of landlords <laughs> sometimes having to sit for long periods of time uh, trying to help a tenant negotiate with the person on the other end of the phone, often around complex issues. Now, some landlords may be prepared to do that, but I think to try and build a system around um, landlords being willing to do that, I guess my worry would be, and I wonder what your view of this is, that if landlords felt that was going to be part of their landlord obligation to potentially having to spend hours with a tenant on the phone and doing that with many tenants and that becomes the standard, could that not lead to yet another reason that landlords may be reluctant to take universal credit tenants if they feel that becomes par for the course? I think similar. Um, things would happen with housing benefit because, again, housing benefit is not a million miles away from universal credit in the terms of data protection. And that, you know, if a landlord, if they don't have a mandate and they don't have that buy in from their tenant, will not get that information either. Now, we would, as, as a responsible um, organisation, ensure that we would take that information and do something with it. Um, whether that's the same in DWP. I don't know to the same extent that that they would they would do that. You know, immediately on, on if there's rent arrears declared, we will put a stop on housing benefit and contact the tenant. I'm assuming that universal credit will be under the same um, the same obligations because you cannot allow fraud and error to enter the system like that. But landlords are, are not saying that they they did have to do that under housing benefit. They're saying that. This is a system that is requiring them to act in a different way. So there must be something that is different about the way the universal credit system operates compared to housing benefit. Otherwise, we wouldn't have landlords raising these concerns and we wouldn't have a rise in arrears. I think it's probably the loss of that local contact because right. it's it's a service centre. Mm -hmm. What the DWP have done, it used to be a virtual service centre, so you could phone and you'd be speaking to somebody in Wales um, or the North of England. They've changed that and there's now a dedicated service centre for the area, which is in Dundee. Mm -hmm. So that local knowledge will be wider it will start to come through and you know it is very early days and you know housing benefit itself was never perfect either no. and you know I would say that mm. um, but 
having having the local knowledge and the local contacts, and as you say, a, a go-to person is is much easier when it's Edinburgh to Edinburgh. But when you widen that net, that's when it becomes mm -hmm. difficult. So you might never speak to the same person twice. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you will speak to the caseworker if the citizen is with you and uses the device that they've registered uh, as part of their claim. So they will get directly through. There won't be the hanging on the phone that, that people complain about. Can I just check that the caseworker in the job centre? It's the caseworker in the service centre. In the service centre. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. OK. Because yep. I know there's sometimes communication issues between the job centre caseworker, who's the work coach, mm -hmm. and the service centre themselves, having yep. visited job centres and had those conversations, which is something DWP is trying very hard to resolve. But mm -hmm. PCS also tell us there's simply not enough staff there to deal to deal with this, given the system. Mr Blackwood, did you want to come in, in relation to... Yeah, obviously, support? backing up everything that's been said there, it's a different job now than what it was before, and fundamentally that, that's wrong. In practical terms, and what landlords are telling us they're having to do now, is that the, the issue is, if you move from housing benefit to universal credit, the landlord is unlikely to know when that's happening, or if it has happened, if they haven't been receiving the money direct themselves, for which the majority don't. So you're completely oblivious to this. You don't know this. The first time you will know is when your tenant doesn't pay the rent on that given deed and then you will go to the tenant and then often what the tenant's saying there's a problem with my claim there could genuinely be a problem with their claim they maybe just don't understand the system and of course the landlord doesn't know they've already received some money as well too as part of that migration process so there's all this confusion and muddle and what we are now saying to landlords well what you can do is you can try and get in touch with a secret person at the end of the phone and, but then what you'll need to do is use the tenant's phone to phone them because that phone number is registered. That's assuming the tenant's got a phone to be able to do that or internet access in their home. So what we're encouraging landlords to do is even use your own smartphones, go online. But these are all issues that we didn't have to deal with before. And then Alice mentioned that this year about the mandates. Now, before what we would have done is got a tenant to sign the mandate to allow us to communicate with the local authority, that mandate is no longer acceptable by universal credit. You have to get one done every single time you want to make a call. That's impractical. So we seem to be creating a system that's so bureaucratic that's certainly not helping the, the people who are in need and encouraging the landlords to take the tenants in the first place. Just to, just to pick up on the relationship aspect, um, we put personal centre tenancy support at the very heart of our organisation and I think you would struggle to find a housing association or a private landlord that has a closer relationship with their tenants. Um, but what we are finding is that a tenant will get notified of something in a journal, um, they will phone us in a panic and our tenancy support team will take two hours out of their day to try and resolve that and they will have to do it again the following two days. If you also had to add in an hour's worth of travel time to go out and see that tenant and come back, it's completely unsustainable. It's just, it's, it just doesn't work. We, we can't spend that much time actually going out to see somebody. Um, and the amount of anxiety that is caused to our tenants when previously we would have received a letter from House and Benefit about a change in circumstances, and we would have phoned up the tenant to reassure them and to let them know the ins and outs of what they've received. Um, that, that's no longer the case. Jo Can I just maybe very, very quickly briefly, back yes. that up? Yeah. Just to, and this is a professional landlord dealing with many of these cases. I'm representing often, as well as Alice, uh, individual landlords with just one property. Mm -hmm. So how can they afford that time and how can they gather that knowledge and expertise that Alice has? Just before it's I let Sheila Hagen, and I am going to, but I mean, this is positive because you're then having a, a conversation which illuminates to us what the issues are, but I'm conscious that Shona Robinson asked the question, I don't know if you want to follow up anything no, else at this point fine. before they come back in and answer again. Are you sure? Yeah. Right. Sheila Haig, um, any, I'll give you the final comment on this section and then we'll move on. From yeah. the 1st of April, um, the Citizens Advice Bureau will be supporting people in receipt of universal credit and supporting that transition. This was formally sitting with local authorities for personal budget and support. Um, it really wasn't a great offering. Um, the funding was poor. I have to say, um, and it didn't allow you to adapt and 
grow a service which would offer what actually universal credit people need. So since that's gone to CAB um, on, the, on the 1st of April, I think that will be a remarkable difference for citizens. I think they will trust CAB perhaps more than walking into a local authority. They'll get access to make their claim, support to make that claim, um, and support through that transitional period as well. So I think that that's a positive move in the right direction, that CAB will support universal credit citizens. Well, to know. I, I mean, I, I'm getting experience where MSPs will be the same, where we quite often refer people to, to, to CAB for help and support. I have looked at the situation in my area where sometimes CAB are sending them to, to myself because they're so overworked to see what representations that, that, that we can make. So if there's additional resource from April, that's absolutely welcome. I think that's something our committee should, should certainly look at. Uh, Keith Brown. Um, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the evidence so far. I'm just conscious of that. Sort of dilemma there was before about um, the direct payments and and um, I suppose really the difference to come back to a point is made between uh, benefit recipients and others is that the taxpayer I think has got a right and an obligation to know that the resources it's applying towards a particular end are actually being used towards that uh, purpose. On the other hand, treating people as individuals, I think, so that the, the point made about a choice being made, perhaps the, the default position being direct payments and then a choice being made if somebody wants to do that. Having said that, I'm thinking of people like veterans as well, many of whom are very content because it's all they've ever known that their rent was paid directly before it came to them. But leaving that aside, just some of the stuff we've heard recently is that um, there's an increasing use of food banks, a 400% increase in food vouchers, I think you said. There's increasing rent arrears, there's increasing demands or, or uh, presentation of homelessness. And a number of, I think at least two of the panel said it's to do with the system, the system itself, whether it's transitionally uh, things or the actual system itself uh, that's causing these things. And it seems to be you're all trying to work around, as is the government, uh, both governments, I'd imagine, trying to sort the problems with it. Are you aware at any time of somebody having looked at the, the inquiries into social security support for housing, of somebody saying from the other end, you know, how you guarantee that people have got um, a safe and secure accommodation, trying to look at it holistically rather than being driven by, in this case, universal credit, previously housing benefit, and then trying to plug the gaps. Has, has anyone ever tried to sort of say this, or are you aware of any systems which do it much more effectively in other countries, perhaps? <laughs> Would, yeah. Um, but it, it needs a system to work around it. So Finland has been really successful using House and First um, to be able to wrap the support around people and maybe try them in several different tenancies. They've, all, they've basically eliminated rough sleeping in their country. Um, I strongly believe that rapid rehousing and, and House and House and First um, is, is, is what we need to be able to do to be able to accommodate people. But then if landlords have mortgages on their properties, so it all goes back to if we put the most vulnerable person into a property and wrap all the support that they need around them, but the rent still doesn't come in, then all we're doing is putting them back into that cycle. They'll go into temp accommodation again. Um, it's just it's just creating a massive chaos index. <laughs> Conscious, we're doing a really good question. We're doing an inquiry on social security as opposed to an inquiry on homelessness. So, how would you change the social security system to do more of that? Because that's the bits that we'll be making recommendations on, is rather than on homelessness, for example. So, what would you do different in the social security system? Give landlords a portal and in increase communication and give better training to people that are in the job centres and in the service centres. Um, I think that in my in my company, if somebody had been in work for a week or two, I would be able to say, oh, they've made an error because they're new. After this length of time, we can't say that people that are in the universal credit service centres don't know what they're doing because it's a new benefit. It, it's affecting people's lives, it's making people homeless, and it needs to be fixed. Okay. Apologies for cutting across there. Keith, do you want to come, come in again? Well, I think I, when I asked the question, I did mention in the context of social security support for housing, and mm -hmm. homelessness is one of the examples of how it doesn't seem to... Working. I'm aware that all three of you are in organisations that are trying to make the system work, but it still seems to be the case. You keep looking for fixes because there need to be fixes to help people. And yeah, I just wonder if a much more holistic approach at social security support for housing might have yielded a, a better outcome rather than 
Or, or maybe it's not. Maybe the incremental find a problem, then find a solution for it. Maybe that's the way you have to go. And I suppose over time, that's what housing benefit did. And the business models changed because it was just the same problems when housing benefit came in. There were people that would not be allowed to or were refused um, accommodation because of housing benefit recipients before. I just wonder whether, you know, endlessly trying to fix it and the different organisations that are involved, whether central government uh, in both its forms, local authorities, providers and so on. I just wondered if, if continually trying to fix a system is not better than uh, looking at the whole system afresh. But. My personal opinion would be if if Scottish Government um, and central government and local authorities worked more collaboratively, um, we all know what the problems are, but um, we feed it back and it's certainly the government will say universal credits, test and learn, it's test and learn, and there is no doubt it's one of the biggest changes in 40 years in the welfare system, and that isn't going to happen overnight. But the, the impact to test and learn on people is significant, um, and it, you know, it can ruin their whole life. But I think the time for maybe campaigning against it has gone, but to work collaboratively to, to sort the problems is where we really need to be. To, to sum up that, I think one of the biggest issues we have in this system, and yes, we know the housing benefit system was never perfect either, we had issues with that equally, uh, but if you have a system where there's a lack of communication, then that inevitably develops into a lack of trust. And ultimately, what we're looking at here in the private rented sector is an individual private landlord with an individual tenant. And it's important we have a good relationship between the two. And both parties have a responsibility to make that work. But what we're seeing in many of the cases that I'm citing is where that relationship has broken down as a result of a system. And that system's based on change. And yes, change is always important. But there seems to be a lack of communication there within the system communicating with us. And that will mean just one thing at the end of the day, that that one private landlord will say, do you know what? I can't be bothered with this. I could be doing something else with my time or letting to somebody else who I feel would be more able to pay the rent in that property. And sadly, that's meaning that people who've done this for many years, despite all the problems with housing benefit, they still kept those tenants. They still maintained that business model. Now they're saying enough is enough. I can't cope with this anymore. Now, back in January, I was invited to a round table with the Cabinet Secretary, Amber Rudd, about this, and she was very clear that she wanted to listen to what we were saying and find the solutions. So I'm kind of hoping, despite the negativity from, from this side of the table, that we will find some of these solutions. But it might be too late for some of those landlords and some of those tenants who will have racked up rent arrears and increased their chances of homelessness. And as a society, we need to be addressing that. Uh, Alison Johnson. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I, I think what we've heard this morning, it, it, it sounds, and in the written submissions too, seems pretty um, uh, damning when it comes to the relationship with the DWP. I mean, there's a submission from a letting agent that, that doesn't pull any punches at all, and that letting agent is suggesting a dedicated and pre-authorised line of communication between the DWP um, and a relevant point of contact at the PRS end that isn't requiring form filling um, on each and every occasion. So I think that point has been well made and that's, that's helpful. But t to me, it seems that the bottom line here in many cases is that the cash is insufficient. You know, we've spent a lot of time this morning talking about the system, but we took evidence um, last week down in Leith from, uh, you know, individuals who'd had... Uh, you know, who were within the private rented sector and organisations too. And one thing that I think came up quite clearly in that evidence was the impact of the benefit cap. Um, we heard from, uh, from young single parents who were relying on DHPs to make up the shortfall. And we were hearing of people ha being handed notice to quit because from one month to the next, it, it just became apparent that, that what were th they were going to receive wasn't enough. And I'd like to explore that impact with Sheila Haig, if I might, in the first instance. Um, City of Edinburgh have apparently spent £28.1 million pounds on temporary B&B accommodation since 2016, and I've no doubt at all you'd rather be spending that money on something else. I mean, imagine the amount of social rented houses that could actually build. So I'd just like to understand, 
you know, we heard we heard evidence last week that some people are just constantly applying for DHPs and living a, a real with real insecurity about whether or not they'd get them. So I'd just like to understand how that is working from your end. Yeah. Um, DHP um, in City of Edinburgh Council has been a significant amount of money. Um, it's around six million pounds uh, the pot for that. Um, in the terms of benefit cap. It's, it's much less than we expected. We expected to have around 900 people going in and out of benefit cap, 900 claims. Mm -hmm. We're only at 300. Um, we did have more initially, but, but these have dropped. Um, and it's people ad ad adjusting, maybe moving to another accommodation, things like that. Now, in, in the private rented sector, what we have been supporting people with DHP is to, to move to um, a cheaper alternative accommodation by giving rent in advance, by giving deposits, and by giving removal expenses. Mm -hmm. So that m takes away that insecurity. Um, however, there are people who we are supporting <laughs> meet the, the shortfall in their rent because of the benefit cap with DHP. Um, when we first went into benefit cap, uh, I make um, you know no bones about this. We were very prudent because we were we were unknown what this was going to look like, and we would we would have had a million pound shortfall um, had the figures panned out as we had expected them to. Um, that turned out not to be the case, and so once we got through the initial three months, we actually applied DHP for longer periods of time, and now we're looking at providing DHP um, where it's a benefit cap for the year rather than short term to take away that insecurity and it helps us as a council manage that as well. Yeah, can I ask how easy it is for you? I mean, obviously we, we heard from young parents who were concerned about having to move into that cheaper accommodation because it could be away from any family or support networks that they might have. So other costs are incurred as a result of losing that support. How easy is it in Edinburgh to find that cheaper accommodation? Um, it, it's not. Um, rents in Edinburgh are, are much higher than our counterparts in Glasgow, for instance. Um, and that is why where people have made reasonable adjustments, where they've tried to, to look at alternative accommodation, we will support them with DHP if there's no alternative. Um, Edinburgh itself is going through quite a significant um, social sector house building programme. And we also have uh, mid-market rent. However, that's not accessible to people purely on benefit. But that model may change in the future as, as the demand um, increases. But I think, you know, we, we are very conscious of the, the cost of accommodation in Edinburgh. And we use our DHP fund um, as much as, as possible. And we are, we are bordering on, on the generous side when we look at people's expenditures. Um, and their income, um, so that we always look for a way to pay DHP, not 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 to pay DHP. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you content at the moment that the the funding you have for DHP is sufficient? Um, I would like the normal hardship DHP to to increase. As a, I think we have we've sorted out um, the um, under occupancy. There's sufficient funding for that. And that will, that's always been fully mitigated mm -hmm. by Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. But I think it's people facing real hardship, not people who are necessarily in receipt of full universal credit or full housing benefit, but people who are the, the working poor, who have maybe um, partial housing benefit and are struggling to, to make, meet that gap because of their expenses. Um, and, you know, they, they're a forgotten, they're a forgotten um, sector of the society um, who who won't maybe ask for help and probably are using food banks more than people in receipt of full housing benefit. Can I just ask a further question? If you know, you're saying that you expect it um, possibly to be contacted by 900 people and it's been about 300. Do you think everyone is aware of the fact that they can contact you for help? Um, well, we, we find out about the benefit cap through the DWP and then we approach the citizen about their benefit cap. Mm -hmm. and we invite them to apply for DHP. So I'm confident that I am reaching those who I need to. OK, okay. thank you very much. Okay. Can I just check before we move on, on to Michelle? You were mentioning the benefit cap there, but there's also the LHA allowance levels, which has, and I just want to just double check, so they've been kind of, if you like, staircasing down the way. So it's now 30% of available commercial rents in any local authority area. And since 2016, that's then been frozen. 
as well. So you would have expected either one of two things to have happened, if not both. One would be the the potential the quality of accommodation that is then on offer, whether the LHA will make the full meet meet the full payment if you're over thirty five, of course, it uh, might go down, or the the select the variety of it goes down, or it puts more pressure on discretionary payments. And it was just that apology, but that exchange between Alison Johnson and, and Sheila Higg seemed to suggest it hadn't been putting additional pressure on it. Maybe I just misheard that, so it's an opportunity to clarify some of that. It, it, would, it would be huge pressure if the fund uh, wasn't sufficient uh -huh. and wasn't significant enough. And we are in the fortunate situation that it is. However, people have been difficult to engage okay. to get them to apply. I mean, there are people who we've written to three and four times to ask them to apply for um, discretionary housing payment. And for whatever reason, people aren't doing that. But we do make every effort to try and get that. In the terms of LHA, I completely agree that it, it is completely out of kilter with the rental market in Edinburgh. And I really feel, and I've made this point, I'm, I'm on a, a group uh, that meets um, in Caxton House with the DWP. Um, and I have made the point on every occasion uh, people are still listening to me, about how Edinburgh needs to have some kind of Edinburgh waiting in the same way as London does, and that benefit cap should align in the way that, that the London boroughs do, so that it's, it's greater than perhaps the rest of Scotland, because accommodation is so difficult to come by and it's so expensive. Michelle, thanks for your patience. I don't know if that John Blackwood or Alice Simpson wants to add anything just before I take, take you in or just move to the next question. And it's obviously an issue with LHA, just not meeting the market. And it's designed not to meet the market for a number of reasons. So again, that's another disadvantage to landlords actually accepting tenants in receipt of benefits. Okay. Um, I would yeah. say it's, it's more extreme in Edinburgh than in Glasgow, but the issue is still in Glasgow. Um, and you can see that mid-market rents are getting offered in Glasgow at higher than, than LHA rates by housing associations at the same time as property prices are increasing. So um, it's, it's just harder. Maybe everyone else understood it already, but that helps my understanding. So, so thank you very much, Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it's been very interesting, actually, and clearly the one thing that's coming out of it is that for private landlords, the communication element is going to be absolutely key in this. Um, but I, I want to just explore a, a couple of things, or a few things that have come up during this discussion, and I just want to delve a little bit deeper in them. The, the first one, which is probably a very quick yay and nay, is obviously data protection has changed over the last couple of years quite significantly. We're all struggling a wee bit with some of that, I think. And I'm assuming that's had part of the impact around some of the communication issues as well. And I just wonder if there's any quick comments about how much of it is related to, to data protection. And do you feel that in terms of that, individuals do have a right to the protection of the data in the first interest? Or should they in some way forgo some of that if they do fail to pay their rent, for example? I don't think you could change data protection mm -hmm. laws because people are, have chosen yeah. to, to be in rent arrears. Um, what I would say is, for me, the difference between housing benefit and universal credit is that's no, that's no changed. We have always been very protective of that data because mm -hmm. technically it was always the DWP's data anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so we have always protected that data and without a mandate we'd not have that discussion even to the point to say if a person was in receipt of housing benefit or not and you'll, you'll have experienced mm. that John um, you know it, it's always been the case and I've worked in benefits for over 25 years and that's never changed right. um, what we do like to do though is make sensible decisions at the back of that so for in my team, I would expect if that conversation had been had and a landlord had been told, I'm sorry, I can't tell you anything, I would expect my officers to be taking action, to, to go in and look at that claim and contact the tenant right. um, to protect their tenancy. So so why can't that happen if a landlord rings up now? And do you see and says, I've got a problem, why? Is it because it's going to the centre as opposed to going to the local? Is that simply I would say the reason? So. And it's yeah. perhaps not been part of their uh, their culture to do that. Right. Whereas it's, it has been a culture 
and uh, because of that local relationship, it has been a culture. Okay, so, so that's something about that. That's fundamentally one of our issues here. We have had those good relationships before. No, I don't see any reason why that can't continue. Mm -hmm. But you do have this faceless DWP, uh, and of course, landlords are saying, "Well, where do we phone?" Well, there's nowhere to phone. There's not a number. There is a number in the city of Edinburgh, but there isn't for the DWP. Right. So we need to create these channels of communication, yeah. Yeah. which don't exist at the moment. And as I say, the cabinet secretary is keen to to develop that the best way we can. Yeah, but absolutely. the issue is we need it now, uh, mm -hmm. and perhaps we should have had it long before now. Okay. So following on that, the, the other one um, you mentioned in passing was about the the use of alternative payments to the DWP system or Scottish options. And you seem to imply that, that having those two uh, and people going for Scottish options rather than alternative payments was causing some issues and confusion. Is it then that because alternative payments now exist, it would be better if we just didn't have a Scottish option and that people just went straight to alternative payments? Is is because that seemed to be what you were implying, particularly Alice, <laughs> you you made that comment. I think it, if I can jump in <laughs> first, I think yeah. I think yeah. it might be easier actually that the Scottish options only applies on the second payment, mm -hmm. not the first payment. Yeah. So the easiest and most sensible thing to do is let it apply on the first payment, and they, that way we don't need to worry about it. And because it does seem to be, and it is anecdotal, but what we are all hearing is that don't go through the alternative payment uh, arrangements through vulnerabilities, just go to the Scottish options, because administratively it seems to be easier. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the feedback we are getting. But mm -hmm. actually, that could mean that that tenant ends up, and that's certainly what we are hearing, ends up in rent arrears, maybe only for a month or so, but that's actually rent arrears that should never existed in the first place, had the continuity of the protection of the payments to the landlord been maintained. And this is for the most vulnerable people we're talking about. And the continuity, if, if they went with alternative payments, if it was already being paid to direct la to the landlord, would that just continue unabated if it went through alternative payments then? So if it's on alternative payments, the issues that we're having um, around if somebody changes from housing benefit to universal credit, um, the people that are administering universal credit are saying that they don't have access to information to see that the housing benefit has been safeguarded for the last 10 years. Um, I don't see any issue with tenants having options, and I think the Scottish options would be good. Um, I think that there's a jar because there's two different governments trying to administer it. Um, arguably, it would be easier if it was all just run in Scotland. Um, <laughs> so, um, if it was just one 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 government that was doing it, it wouldn't really it wouldn't make as much difference. Um, the issue is that, that, that there's an option that seems to get means tested before it gets implemented. Um, it's all to do with the administration of the, the system. Okay. Sheila, anything to add? Um, I really do think that. Um, the alternative payment arrangement, if that goes from month one, that's probably easier than having Scottish options. And it's probably a very confusion, confusing time where people are moving from either one benefit or, or another or they've lost their job and moving into that. If, if there's to be an alternative payment, it should be from day one um, if the tenant agrees to that. Um, and I think leaving it a month, it's, it's a temptation that, that perhaps isn't needed. Uh, for, for some people, and I will reiterate, I mean a very small amount of people. My final one, which is sort of combined then, is, is a couple of things that I've been hearing from private landlords, and I just wondered whether you'd, you'd been hearing the, the same sort of thing. So a couple of landlords told me that actually the tenancy laws change is also making them rethink their modelling. So it's not just about some of the benefit changes, it's about the whole of the changes that have gone on around being a landlord. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'd be interested in, in your views on that. And the other one is, in terms of arrears, and I've been looking at some of the numbers, I had some in yesterday from, from one of the councils, they seem to be coming back down to the same level. Um, this is an area which has had you know, UC Act rolled out for a wee while now, and they're back down at the same level as they were at the point of rollout. Um, so, and then been falling year on year. And when I was talking to the, some of the landlords about this, what they were saying is that a lot of the arrears are cash flow arrears as opposed to permanent arrears. And their biggest gripe is that they didn't know where the money was in the system. It seemed to have sort of disappeared between leaving, in effect, or the allocation of it by the DWP and the arrival of it in the landlord's 
um, account in a way in which they could reconcile it and say, yes, that tenant has paid. So, you know, and for me, there's a huge difference between arrears, as in the, the tenant's gone out, spent them, and you're never going to get them, or it's going to be very difficult to get them, and the tenants, it's been allocated, it's, it's been paid, but it hasn't arrived with the landlord, and cash flow is a huge issue for private landlords, as you know, clearly. So I just wondered if you've got any thoughts on that. Because of time constraints, I just want to give a time check to everyone. You're going to get one bite at answering that, and then Mr Griffin's got a, a, a follow-up question, and I've got a very brief one to finish off, but we need to be out inside five, ten minutes. Unfortunately, just time constraints with the Thursday morning slot, so my apologies in advance for that. Sheila Haig, did you want to come in? Um, what I would say, um, what Edinburgh's experience is, is that of people who go into rent arrears with universal credit, 90, over 90% 90 of them had legacy arrears anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not necessarily that you see has caused an arrears problem, it may have made it a wee bit worse because of um, when the payment's made. Um, but certainly um, what, what other local authorities experience, and we're we are new to the party in Edinburgh because we only went live in November, but first three months you see a spike mm -hmm. and then it starts to settle down and it's kind of, it's, it's a pattern that's been played out in most local authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally welcome the new PRT. I think it's great. Um, to me, the only thing that it does is take away a no-fault ground for eviction. I've never heard of a landlord wanting to evict somebody when there isn't another ground that would apply, such as antisocial behaviour or rent arrears, given that I've also only ever taken one person forward for eviction. Um, rent arrears, we break up our technical versus our actual arrears. We would never, ca ca we would never, we would never count a technical arrear where we can work out where it's from as an arrear because we know it will come in at some point. Um, we have found that regularly there's um, a week or two missing at the start of a universal credit claim, especially if it's a new claim that's not been somebody on housing benefit previously. Um, and there is something to, if we don't have the information as well, if we can't see what dates it applies to, then how can we know if it's a technical arrear or an actual one? Yeah, with regards to the tenancy, obviously with the new private residential tenancy, I, I'm not aware of where necessarily certainly the members contacting us saying the, the issues with the tenancy regime here and our lack of confidence in taking tenants and receipt of benefits. There is an issue, of course, with one of the... Uh, with tenancy generally, not just oh, sorry, people on yeah. benefits. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In fairness, though, I think with the new tenancy, uh, mm -hmm. there is this issue, of course, landlords will be reluctant to go and rent arrears grounds, mm -hmm. uh, simply because if there is an issue through the administration of the benefit system, they are unlikely to get that eviction. So that, that, is, a, that is a real issue for some landlords uh, to pick up on. I think with regards to level of rent arrears, whether it's actual, technical, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, certainly I, I've heard that more from a social landlord colleague saying that that's been an issue for them, mm -hmm. so it's not an actual arrear. Whereas in our sector, it does tend to be an actual arrear because landlords in the private rental sector generally charge rent up front, so mm -hmm. you pay in advance. Mm -hmm. So of course, benefits has always been traditionally paid in arrears. So therefore, by the time they haven't paid the arrears mm. uh, of the, the the rent that they're due to pay it is an actual arrear. So, mm. as well as it being a cash flow issue, but I think I'm more concerned about actual arrears that have accumulated as a result of universal credit. Mm. Mm. Was that a clarity, I think, Debbie. If you want to check check in relation to that, yes, yeah, yeah, Sheila. It's just so I've noted what you said there that ninety percent had legacy arrears anyway, and that's a pattern that we played out across local authorities. I just wanted to check. Is, this, is it your position that the issue of arrears caused by universal credit still applies? Because well, John had quite a strong view on that, which I noted, and it's as my own personal view, you must, there must be an inbuilt level of arrears because of the design of universal credit. That how does anyone ever catch up with that? Do, do you disagree with that? or? Not entirely, right. but what I will say is that the two-week housing benefit run-on um, for people who are transitioning, um, you know that that's an additional amount of money, um, and then if if they do get um, their universal credit advance, um, that can be used. Oh, hold on, if they get if they, they choose to take we, it, just be clear, it's their choice to ask for an advance. It's their choice right. if they want to take the advance. Lots of, ah, but most people will not choose to take the advance because I have no evidence that that's the case. Right. I think it would be quite helpful to get 
to get some I would just like some clarity around this. Do we both agree that the advance is a choice for the tenant? And then we don't know how many people would choose that. But if they don't choose the advance, do you agree or disagree that the five-week wait without the advance would, would naturally cause separate level of arrears or not? It would, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. ah, that's what I thought. But, you know, it's it's where, where we get people, say, contacting Scottish Welfare Fund uh, because they're, they're in dire straits because they've chosen not to take their advance. Our, our first line is that they need to to contact the DWP and take that advance. Okay. Yeah, no, I to understand that yeah. that's your advice, yeah. but even those who take the advance might still be in arrears because they have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, uh. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave all of that hanging. I can see Alice Simpson watching in as well. Please send us a note in relation to whatever you wanted to say on this. I'll say that again in a second. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camilla. Just to come back to the issue of discretionary housing payments, you spoke about how um, Edinburgh are operating that in respect to, to tenants who are affected by the benefit cap. But um, further to what the convener is saying, how, how are you operating discretionary housing payments for um, tenants whose um, actual rent is lower than the local housing allowance? We apply the exact same calculation. So we will ask them what their income is, what their expenditure is. We'll add on an allowance for things that people have forgotten. Um, we'll question whether, um, you know, is that a reasonable, if they've only put down a, a small amount for food or whatever, um, we'll, we'll question them, is that reasonable? And, and we may just adjust that. Um, it's We, we operate it. I, I believe in a very fair process, and you know it does take account of people having maybe an emergency one week or an you know an unexpected cost. So um, I'm pretty confident that our DHP is operating how it should for everyone, not just people in benefit cap, but people in general hardship. And you spoke about a, a year-long award. Would that be the same situation for those whose rent um, is above the local housing allowance? Because my experience in my own region is that people will be offered a discretionary housing payment for one or possibly two months to give them the time to find accommodation that is at the local housing allowance level, and then after that they'll be left to fend for themselves. Each case is looked at in its merit, you know, in its own merits. Um, so each case is individually assessed, and we would look at: is it reasonable for this person to move? Well, then we would probably do it for when I say the year, I mean the financial year. Sorry, yeah. you know, so depending on when they applied, it would be for that financial year as long as the fund lasts, basically. Um, but where where we think the rent is unreasonable and the expenditure is unreasonable, we may make a shorter term award, but that will be revisited. So if the person comes back after three months and says I, I couldn't find anywhere else, we'll review that as well. That certainly seems to be more generous than the experience in, in my region. Do you have any um, knowledge of how other councils are operating discretionary housing payments? Um, uh, each each council has the right to operate the discretionary housing payment fund how they want. What I will say is Edinburgh's pot is significant in comparison to some others, and it could potentially just be a, a constraint within that local authority that they, the DHP that they've been awarded doesn't actually cover uh, what they need to pay out. Okay, thank you. We have to explore. I reckon any other questions we have can be asked in public session, but you may just have to drop us a note with the answers given time constraints. But Sean, I know you wanted yeah. to come well, in. One of the issues that was raised by uh, people in Leith was around the cost of temporary accommodation. So it's more one for Sheila Haig, and uh, the, the people were citing £1,900 a month being charged, and how uh, unaffordable that was, particularly for people who you described as a working poor and an unmet need. I, I can't understand how someone who um, is working could ever afford that level of cost if they end up, unfortunately, in temporary accommodation. How can that level be justified? These, um, the levels uh, being set, um, uh, that's PSL properties, £1,900. Um, is that £1,900 a month? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's, that is, is significant. Um, and we do have uh, quite a significant, I think it's 25% of people in homeless are working. What I would say is that, you know, the homeless team will work closely with people about the affordability of that. Um, and we would never um, evict someone, you know, from temporary accommodation. Uh, but we will work with them and we will 
you know, the council has an obligation to protect the public purse as well. So if we need to recover monies from people, we'll do that. But that has to be done in a sensible manner. I mean, it would be good to maybe get some follow-up information, because not least a breakdown of the justification for that level of, of charge, because people are citing this as exactly the same property as one next door, which isn't labelled temporary accommodation, and there's no additional services for that money, so it would be helpful to yeah. get a breakdown of, of how that charge is, is reached. I, I can provide a breakdown from my colleagues in that team uh, to the committee at a later date. That, that would be really helpful, and any additional information you can give about uh, what area of the social security system picks up some of those costs if the person's entitled to it and where the person would have to pick up costs and it's certainly not unique to Edinburgh and Glasgow I know working poor who find themselves homeless who have to choose to sofa surf with other family members because they simply can't afford the temporary accommodation and quite significant levels of um, rent for storing furniture and the like so we, we certainly think there might be more money in the system that could be better used. The question I was going to have, which I would like to leave la leave hanging, please come back to us on it, was certainly my constituency case was one of the issues is in relation to deposits required for the private rented sector. And d different landlords have got different rules around that. And the social security system doesn't seem to offer much scope for actually paying some of those deposits. And there's some really good deposit, uh, tenancy deposit schemes out there and trying to help people build up deposits or standing as guarantors for for different individuals and families. But actually, I'm just wondering if there's scope for the social security system to step in in some circumstances and actually be much more direct in paying appropriate landlords in the private rented sector um, uh, deposits, which would actually bring landlords back into the game that are maybe opting out at, at the moment. So. That's quite a substantive question which we've not explored. I don't expect an answer to it just now. I really don't because we've got time constraints. But is that something you could think about and maybe give a note back, back to the committee? Because I think we'll explore it with other witnesses. I would like to have your, your views on that as well. So we got there. We, I think we could have done this for another hour. And it's really always really important when we get that exchange of views and actually, quite frankly, a variance of views as well because that's kind of the point we want to hear those, those different perspectives. So can I, can I thank all three witnesses for your your time here this morning, please do follow the work of the committee and if other evidence sessions uh, emerge and there's things that you strongly agree with or strongly disagree with or you think the evidence base that's been cited to us is weak, uh, please come back and tell us because we want you to kind of follow this inquiry as it, as it goes through. So thank you for our first uh, three public session witnesses in relation to this inquiry. That ends agenda item two and we'll suspend briefly before we move to agenda item three. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back. We now move to agenda 
item three, which is immigration and social security coordination EU withdrawal bill UK Parliament legislation. And the committee will take evidence on a legislative consent memorandum on the UK Parliament Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill from Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, Colin Brown, Solicitor Stephen O'Neill, Social Security Policy Team Leader, and Kieran Watson, Migration and Free Movement of People Team Leader, Scottish Government. Thank you all four of you for being with us this morning. And Cabinet Secretary, have you an opening statement for the committee this morning? Yes, thank you, Convener. The UK Government's Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill aims to achieve three things. First, to end freedom of movement and bring EEA nationals and their family members under UK immigration control. Second, to protect the status of Irish citizens in UK immigration law once their EU free movement rights end. And third, to create powers for UK ministers, Scottish ministers and Northern Ireland to amend, by regulation, retained EU law governing social security coordination. It is the proposed conferral of this power onto Scottish ministers that triggers the convention that UK ministers should seek the consent of the Scottish Parliament. The social security coordination provisions can be viewed as a logical extension of the statutory instruments considered by the committee in January. The committee will recall that those instruments made the necessary technical fixes to allow retained EU coordination rules to operate effectively in a domestic setting. This means that people entitled to benefits in virtue of these rules will be protected in a no-deal scenario. But the instruments were made under a single-use power. This means the rules are frozen with no mechanism to allow for revisions or updates. The powers proposed in this bill address that, allowing the retained rules to be adjusted for future policy development and to keep pace with any reforms of coordination at EU level. In addition to UK ministers, the bill proposes that the Scottish ministers and devolved administration in Northern Ireland also get a power for matters within devolved competence. Though having such a power might be a useful tool, we have no plans to exercise it. The UK government's approach to coordination has actually been broadly positive to the extent of committing honouring the rules even in a no-deal deal, no deal scenario. The political declaration on future relationship also makes reference to the desirability of ongoing coordination in the future. Under normal circumstances, the Scottish government might therefore have been minded to propose a consent motion. But we do not live under normal circumstances. There are fundamental constitutional issues at stake here. The decision of the UK Government to ignore the will of the Scottish Parliament and proceed with the EU Withdrawal Bill has undermined trust in the Seoul Convention. And as in the 2018-19 programme for Government makes clear, until such time as the Convention can be strengthened in a way that restores trust, the Scottish Government will only bring consent motions in the most exceptional of circumstances. As the memorandum explains, the powers proposed in this bill might be useful at some undetermined point in the future, but it is not in any way essential to the delivery of the devolved social security programme. The bill cannot therefore be considered to present exceptional circumstances. I will close by saying a few words about the provision that seek to end freedom of movement. The memorandum acknowledges that these fall within reserved competence. They are therefore not strictly relevant to the question of legislative consent. But the evidence is unequivocal. Ending freedom of movement will profoundly harm Scotland's economy, its communities and its global reputation as a welcoming and progressive nation. To cite just one example, our universities are already seeing significant fall in the number of EU students. <clears throat> It is objectionable, too, that ending freedom of movement is presented in an EU withdrawal bill as though it is a necessary consequence of EU exit. As the alternatives proposed by the Scottish Government make clear, that is simply not the case. The referendum result is being used as a political cover for misguided and deeply damaging policy choices. This Government would therefore be failing in its duty to the people of Scotland, especially those who are EEA nationals, if it had allowed these provisions to pass without comment. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer questions. OK, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for stating the Scottish Government position on this. Are there any questions from members at this point? Mr Griffin? Thanks, Camira. Um, I understand the Government's reason for not seeking um, to lodge an LCM. That's probably a broader debate for, for somewhere else. Um, but I just wanted to ask if there are any practical implications for um, not lodging that motion. We can't see any practical implications for it. At first reading, this might appear quite a wide power, but um, in reality, we do not view it as that. And I, I give one example of that. Uh, there is um, a great degree of overlap between immigration 
uh, policy and social security. So we would not, as a Scottish government, be able to make unilateral changes to social security uh, without obviously having a due recourse to what's happening at a UK immigration level. And that would obviously have um, significant um, implications. So although the power seems quite wide, when you actually look at how practically the Scottish government would use it, because of its overlap, particularly with immigration, I don't see any practical difficulties uh, to, to the decision that we've taken on this. Okay, thanks. Okay. I thought that was important to get on the official report. That's the only question okay. that I have. Okay, we've got a few more bits for questions. Shona Robinson. Should I spot oh, yourself first, Shona? Sorry, no, no, that's fine. Um, I, I mean, I think you absolutely would agree um, about not lodging an LCM, given the, the damage uh, that this will do. But I guess on a specific question, the and you maybe just touched on this, the fact that the the coordination provisions are included in a bill that's principally concerned with immigration um, suggests a link between the two policy areas. Is there something the committee should be more aware of in that regard? Um, well, I'd have to be frank and say it's difficult to say um, because the Scottish Government were given very late notice about the fact that these uh, social security aspects would be attached to the immigration bill. Um, and it's not been, uh, let's say, a, a great example of the, the due process that would normally happen for a Westminster bill that contains a, a, a devolved aspect. Uh, because around social security um, and I, I think that's been a, a matter of regret obviously my officials have been in close contact um, since we have been advised of this policy uh, that will be in and has devolved implications but the reasoning why these are at attached um, has is I think unfortunate because it, it pins it together with uh, some deeply deeply concerning immigration laws that the UK government would wish to put through. Are you given any reason for the delay? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Convener. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to concur with the statement you made about the importance of freedom of movement to Scotland. Um, I just wondered, um, without uh, rehearsing all the arguments, um, you did say unless the UK government restores trust, is that, is that just a wider reference to the whole Brexit debate or is there something else? Well, I think it's, it's very important uh, that the trust is... Um trust comes back to the, the SEAL pr procedure, and that is a, a wider issue for, for this Parliament. Uh, Michael Russell has written to the UK government, I think now twice, um, on this aspect, um, particularly um, raising suggestions as to how trust in the SEAL procedure um, could, the SEAL convention, um, could could be um, maintained, enhanced, and and that is a very important aspect this Parliament will need to look at. So it sits, it, it because of Brexit, but I think even if at some point there is a resolution to the mess there is Brexit at this moment, then we will still need to look very, very seriously at how we can have trust within the SEAL convention, as we used to do in the past. Thank you very much. Okay. Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, can I, can I just check, uh, uh, for my understanding really, it's a straight question. Um, when we leave the EU, does not having an LCM in place, and it's sort of following on slightly from Mark Griffin's question, does that mean you would have to go back subsequently and agree something? Or are you saying that the position is such, that, and the co coordination and cooperation is such, that nothing subsequently will happen, but you will have that power anyway? Well, um, the SSIs that the committee um, looked at in January uh, dealt with the no deal, no deal scenario and what would happen. And as I say, on, on that aspect, the, the UK government has had um, a, 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 an open uh, dialogue with the Scottish government and uh, with the EU um, around ensuring that um, people will still have access to, to benefits in a no deal scenario. When it comes to actually what happens um, it, when this, um, because we haven't um, lodged an L, a legislative consent motion, it is up to the UK government to carry on with the bill as they see fit. Now, in other circumstances, they haven't taken the power for Scottish ministers out of their bill. 
um, but it's up to them to decide how they would carry on with uh, the Immigration and Social Security Bill, whether they would still include these powers for, for Scottish ministers or, or take them out. Well, again, I go back to the point I made to, to members earlier on that I don't see any practical um, reasons why we would be concerned either way. But if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that technically, by not having LCM, the UK government could choose to not embed the powers in the withdrawal bill. By signing an LCM, they would be embedded in the withdrawal bill. Um, it makes no difference um, because of the way that the SEAL Convention is being interpreted. It, it, the UK government can carry on with this bill as it is currently drafted, whether we lodge a legislative consent motion or not. So you think it's just an irrelevant piece of... I, I, I think if we had been in normal circumstances, um, then I could be here suggesting that we do lodge a le legislative consent motion and that the Scottish Government would, uh, would support that. But we are not in normal circumstances, and that's why we're here today. But presumably, if we, had, if we lodge an LCM, it would be unthinkable of the UK Government to ignore it. If we don't lodge one, then... Well, the, the entire reason that the Scottish Government has uh, taken um, the, the action that it has is because when we looked at the European Union Withdrawal Act in 2018, uh, the Scottish Parliament voted 93 votes to 30 to refuse consent, um, and then the UK Government went ahead. It is entirely because uh, we had a legislative consent motion um, in that aspect, and the UK Government took the decision that it did, that we have the breakdown of trust under the SEAL Convention. So you do think LCMs are, are irrelevant now, then, in effect? I, I th I, it's it's well, not a position... If we didn't think they were relevant, we would still do them. But if we're saying we're not going to do them anymore because we okay, don't think so they're going to be listened to... The yeah. question has been put, so what would your response to that be? Legislative consent motions have been a very, very important aspect of this Scottish Parliament. That is why it is deeply concerning and deeply worrying that the UK government has rid ridden roughshod over that convention in the past, and why it's important as a Parliament, I think, that we come together to ensure that that trust can can be uh, brokered and we can get that trust back. Um, a couple of questions myself, Cabinet Secretary. Just an observation, first of all. I think by its very nature that it's a convention, it's not a constitutional right or guarantee that this parliament has, and I think that's pretty important. Uh, would your position perhaps be that if you did lodge, if the Scottish Government did lodge this LCM, whilst there's some reasonable aspects to it, and as Mr Griffin ascertained, there's no unintended consequences that you can see in relation to this, might you feel the Scottish Government was complicit to the underlying piece of legislation which is to restrict freedom of movement and rights of European citizens in some areas? I think it would have um, been an exceptionally difficult position for the Scottish Government to be in, to be in effect giving a legislative consent motion to something which takes away uh, the rights of our most valued EU citizens. It's not a position, um, it is a, a hypothetical position because of the, the aspect that we're in, but it once again raises concerns about uh, the link between uh, social security and immigration that's been made within this bill is highly unfortunate. Okay, that, that said, my understanding is that the underlying piece of UK legislation both I suppose and guarantee certain rights in relation to social security and the power that in theory would be conferred on Scottish ministers if this was put through as an LCM would be the, the variance of some of the technical aspects of those rights or the changing of those aspects of those rights that, that may accrue if the, the, the underlying bill is passed. Would that be a correct understanding of the LCM that we're looking at here today? Because we've all spoken in very general terms. No one's actually looking at the details of what this actually does or doesn't do. Would that be a, a reasonable, very simplistic perspective in relation to what, what the underlying LCM is? I mean, basically, the, the statutory instruments which the committee looked at dealt with what would happen in a no deal, and that allowed the reciprocal arrangements to, to, to carry on. That was very important, and that's why I was, and the Scottish Government was, supported of those. This legislative consent memorandum is detailing um, what a power that could be used in the future if we wanted to make changes to 
the reciprocal arrangements. But as I say, their link to immigration makes the fact that we would use these in um, a very, very small uh, manner of cases. Just one yes, further point that, that might be worth adding to that is that um, the scope of the Scottish Government's ability to exercise a power of the nature that's in the bill um, is also restricted by the, the reciprocal nature mm -hmm. um, of the way the rules work, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so um, exportability of benefits, for example, relies on all of the EU states agreeing to do that. So although Scottish, the, the power, as the DPRC pointed out, looks very broad, the immigration provisions and just the way that the world, the, the, sorry, the rules work administratively. It, so, for example, if the Scottish government wanted to bolt some new um, provision onto the rules that wasn't reciprocated across the EU, that would be a very difficult thing to do indeed. Um, the Scottish government would then have to have in place bilateral agreements with all um, 27 EU member states plus the rest of the, um, the social security jurisdictions in the UK, um, where the power could be used as a, in a circumstance whereby um, the UK government decided to withdraw or restrict the way that um, it planned to um, execute the rules, so using the exportability of benefits. Example again, in a world where the, and there's no suggestion at all that this is the case, in a world where the UK government decided that it wasn't going to export a particular benefit anymore, and Scottish ministers still wanted to do that, and then theoretically that power um, would allow Scottish ministers to continue to do that. But as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, the UK government um, appears to know the, the value of coordination of social security, um, and I don't think that Scottish ministers have any objection to the way that the UK government are, are planning to approach that. Okay, final question. Colleagues want, want to come in there, ask one or two other questions. Given that the DPLR committee has raised concern over the, the wide scope of the powers, I take, take on board what the Cabinet Secretary, Mr O'Neill, has said in relation to this. If at some point in the future um, this Parliament, not the UK Parliament, was to consider returning to this matter, do you think it, it, it's worthy of a bit more consideration than, than perhaps it has been given the fact the UK bill itself was only presented, I think, in December? last year? Does it all feel just a little bit rushed, perhaps? I, I think the timing of it is e exceptionally unfortunate. And as I say, the, the, the usual um, time that we would have had, and indeed the Parliament would have had, to, to examine these in, in detail has, has been greatly curtailed. This may be an issue which, uh, again, might we might come back to in the, in the future. Uh, but I think it is important to stress that actually on, on this issue, the UK government's approach to reciprocal arrangements um, has been um, overall positive, and that I, I think does does need to be to be recognised because that does negate the fact that we would take a, a different approach to the UK government on this. Okay, thank you, uh, Alice Rallon, followed by Keith Brown. I can understand the Scottish government's uh, reasons for for uh, taking action or, or not lodging the, the LCM, um, given the implications you've dis described both for. Um, constitutional questions and also the freedom of movement, but I just wonder, has um, the UK given any indication that it understands or has commented in any way in, in detail on any of those concerns? Obviously other members have mentioned the importance of, uh, of trying to get to the bottom of, of this problem and trying to find if there's a, a way of, of introducing some faith back into the process around the Sewell Convention. I just wonder if the the UK government has offered any commentary on your concerns? Well, the uh, second letter which Michael Russell wrote to the UK government um, was sent on the 6th of December. Um, that once again, and he also wrote on the 12th of September, he, he in those letters had detailed uh, suggestions, proposals on how the, the trust um, could come back to the Sewell Convention. It deals with one of the aspects that the convener mentioned that this is just a convention um, and that it would have, uh, he suggested, including the strengthening of the statutory protection in the Scotland 2016 Act, for example. Um, so those suggestions have been made to the UK government. My understanding is, um, as yet, uh, Mr Russell has had no reply to that letter. Anything else, Mr. Allen? That's me. Thank you. Keith Brown. Yeah, as the convener said, it's always uh, useful to look at the detail. It's our obligation to do that. But just if we pan out for a second, there's two really quite sad things happening here. One is the diminution of the rights of uh, EU citizens, because this directly impacts, and I don't think I should pass without comment. Uh, and the other is about the LCM. It's be interested in the 
Cabinet Secretary's view. In 2010, if you remember, we were told there was a respect agenda. Uh, after the referendum in 2014, we were told there was going to be a very powerful parliament with its rights enshrined in law. And then shortly afterwards, we had Lord Keane in the Supreme Court saying that this convention was merely a self-denying ordinance on the part of the UK government. Given what you said about the way that um, uh, the LCM is now viewed by the respective governments, do you think it's it's now just a dead letter, or is it retrievable in any way? And do you see any signs that the UK government is going to change its attitude towards LCMs and the rights of this parliament? I think it is absolutely um, um, possible for... Uh, the Scottish and UK governments to get to a position where there is trust in this again. But that takes both parties to be able to, to redefine that trust. And I think it will take movement from the UK government, as Mr Russell has defined in his letter, to actually ensure that this is embedded in and is much more than just a convention. This is an area which we will undoubtedly come back to in all our committees in the Parliament and in the wider setting, because this was, up until the withdrawal bill, a very, very important aspect of how relations between the Scottish and UK governments worked. And we do need to get back to that. There is certainly a will within the Scottish Government, as shown by the letters that Mr Russell has written, to get back to that. And we've came um, up with uh, concrete proposals about how that could happen. It does take the UK Government to respond to that, to be able for that trust to be built up. This is a, obviously um, an aspect that involves both parties. Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to say that I fully understand and endorse uh, the government's view that it can't recommend that Parliament consents to the provisions of the bill. And um, I too, um, you know, I think this is incredibly sad. I've got great regret at the removal of freedom of movement um, uh, and the potential damage that has for our communities and services. But um, we've had a discussion uh, sort of on... It, <laughs> I think it is very serious. You can say something's, you know, simply a convention, but it's sometimes those softer things that build relationships and trust. And when you can, when you discard something simply because you can, because you think there are no consequences. I mean, I think that's far from the case here. There are consequences, but I just like to understand. You know, there's been a discussion on the, the LCM, um, you know, protocol more widely, but on this particular matter, this particular issue, will the Cabinet Secretary be corresponding further with her counterparts in the UK government? Yeah, I, I certainly had a, a conversation, I think it was the day before this bill was introduced um, in Westminster. Um, I was informed uh, on a phone call that there would be social security aspects to it, although officials had had previous contact. Uh, since then, officials have been in, uh, in a great deal of contact to distress to their counterparts the Scottish Government's position and our, um, our approach to legislative consent motions in general, and that it would be unlikely that the Scottish Government uh, would would consent, and that was the point I, indeed I made on um, my my phone call. Um, so, obviously, once this process has has gone through committee, then we would of course be um, putting that um, in writing and reason our concerns, reason why we've got here. Uh, my um, the fact that I, I don't I don't do this um, light heartedly, and I, I don't do that unaware of the consequences. But there is a wider aspect that we need to look at um, for for the. LCMs in general, and um, before any cabinet secretary could take a different position. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, yeah. Good morning, cabinet secretary. Two just very brief questions. Uh, just so I can get clear in my head. In principle, forgetting all the kind of stuff around consents and all that, but in principle, the power that this will give or could give to the Scottish government, in principle, you have no problem with and would welcome? We are uh, not here because I'm um, not recommending the, the power. I'm not objecting to the power. I'm not refusing consent. It is because of the wider constitutional aspects that we're here. Okay, helpful. Uh, and secondly, if this bill goes through as it is and becomes an act, that power comes to the Scottish Government if the bill is an amendment, that's clearly a decision for the Westminster Parliament, but if the bill works its way through and becomes an act and stays exactly as it is at the moment in regard to these particular regulations, that power 
comes to the Scottish Government. That's it's, right. it's, it's up to, to UK ministers yeah. to decide whether that yeah. power stays in or not. Well, it, it, well, presumably it's up to the Westminster Parliament. Well, it, 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 it becomes, you know, it, it ultimately it's, 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 it's a bill that becomes an act. Yes. And that would be a decision for the Scottish Parliament, uh, sorry, for the UK Parliament to make. You're quite right, for the UK Parliament, yes. UK ministers will have a view, I'm sure, but yeah. it is indeed up to the UK Parliament. The sovereignty of Parliament. Yeah. Any more questions on that? OK. Um, I thought we had a good, good airing of, of the issues there. That, that concludes our, our, our consideration at this point. Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary and officials, for coming along uh, to discuss these matters with us. And we now move to Agenda Item 4, which were previously agreed to take in private. So we now moved into private session. Thank you.